This is Bishop Gregory Brewer giving the sermon September 29, 2013 at Grace Episcopal Church, Port Orange, Florida. I want you to know, and I say this often, but I, I really mean it. And that is, when I come to sermons, I'm not just coming as sort of a hired gun to give a word from the bishop to the parish. I'm actually preaching to me as much as anybody. Because quite honestly, I'm just as much in the need of a word from God as anybody else here in the room. So when I'm saying at the beginning, speak, Lord, your servants are listening, I'm going, <laughs> I'm one, I'm ready. And particularly this morning, these are actually almost chilling passages of Scripture. Um, this is one of those things where, oh, if that's the word of God, I don't know whether I want to put my feet in there or not. Because of the fact that it asks so much of us. In fact, I must confess to you that I am very grateful that given the juxtaposition of the language of the blessings, we begin by the colic that says, Oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. And I'm thinking, boy, do I need that right now. And in fact, that's a part of the intention of these scriptures. To drive us to the point to face things about ourselves that we wouldn't actually want to face. So that we have reason to cry out to God. To give us the mercy and, in fact, the pity that we actually need. You see, a part of the thrust of scriptures and one of the points is not only to reveal to us who God is, but also to reveal to us who we are. And sometimes that's wondrous, full of joy, child of God, inheritor of the kingdom. Let's get at it. And then other times they're going, oh, I wish I hadn't heard that. <laughs> These scriptures sort of fall in the latter category. Because, you see, we live in a culture, and we're in it. It's not a them, it's an us. We live in a culture that really values two things pretty much more than anything. One is time. And the freedom to use our time as we see fit. I mean, after all, what is my inheritance as an American? Life, liberty, liberty the pursuit of happiness. And a part of how we have interpreted that phrase is that I have the right to pretty much do whatever I want, whenever I want, so long as I don't break the law, or in reality, <clears throat> so long as I don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, what the scripture asks of us is a level of generosity and sacrifice. It really does fly in the face of that kind of me-ordered approach to how I spend my time. The same is true for the issue of money. We live in a culture that basically holds up and admires people who are uh, people of wealth. And many of us aspire, even if we don't have the bank account, to at least look like we have something. We may not be buying our clothes at Neiman Marcus, but we try to get the ones that look like that from T.G. Mack. So it, it's a part of what's in us to, in essence, look successful. To, we want to be well thought of. And in this culture especially, to what brings, he's doing really well, isn't he? When somebody says that to you, you automatically assume most of the time that what they're talking about is financial gain. Whether that shows up with the kind of car that's been driven, the kind of house that one's live in, the places one visit on vacation, the where, where you go and eat at the restaurants, the people that you know, the, the power connections that come with an accumulation of money, all of those for us are, what's the word? Impressive. And it's very curious to me, and quite honestly deeply convicted, that in the story that we have in the Gospel reading this morning, the man in the story who has a name is Lazarus. And who's Lazarus? He's the beggar. 
The other character in the story has no name. He's just generic. He's the rich man. He could be almost anyone. And believe me, in the scriptures, names are extraordinarily important. So that if Jesus tells a story about the rich man and Lazarus, his point is, Lazarus is the one who's really important in this story. We would do exactly the opposite. We would say, if we were to tell the story, you know, there's this huge house just south of here, and it's right on the river. You know it belongs to, I don't know, let's make up a name, Henry Cabot Lodge the Fourth. <laughs> and have you ever noticed, there's this homeless guy that sits out front by the gate into his estate. See, we would say just the opposite. We would make sure that we knew the name of the guy that owned the home. And the person sitting in front, he's that homeless guy. We wouldn't know his name. Why would we know Henry Cabot Lodge IV? Well, probably because there'd be a lot of buzz about the fact that he just built this multi-million dollar estate down on the river, or there'd be some connection that someone would know him through some sort of an organization, or hope of all hopes, Maybe he goes to our church. <laughs> <laughs> so we would know his name, and we would not be afraid to drop it when necessary. Just to let people know, yeah, we, we, we're connected to people like him. It's, it's a really insidious kind of game. And most of us would never, ever want to be publicly identified with the homeless guy. We wouldn't know his name sitting at the gate, hoping that somehow when the professional cook throws out the scraps after the big, huge cocktail party that happened the night before, he'd get a little bit of it. That's, that's the story that's being told here. And the reason we think like that is because, like everything we read about and what our culture shows us in media and the like, is that it's, it's the Henry Cabot Lodges to which we aspire. We want to be like them in some way or another, whether it's vicariously through all of the gossip shows that are everywhere, entertainment tonight, and you fill in the blank, so that we keep track of, oh, it's his fourth marriage, I understand. Or whether it's we want to be like them in some way or another. It's, we look for this common place of affinity, so we want to know where they go on vacation. All those kinds of things. We don't really care about Lazarus at all. Unless we have this, and sometimes it's extraordinarily bad for us. We want to minister to homeless people. And what we mean by that is that we want to give a little bit of our income to try to help somebody else out. Which in and of itself is actually not a bad thing at all. But to talk about homeless people is very different from saying, I'm going down to the soup kitchen today to have lunch with Jack. See, that implies a friend. Somebody you know. You know where he's come from. You know how he ended up on the street. You're interested in what's going on in his family. That kind of name implies relationship. And that's, again, a part of the point of the story. We're not talking about patronizing anything. We're talking about caring about the pain of another human being, regardless of whether that is socially to our credit or not. And the whole implication is, is that just like with our time, also with our money, God has a say-so about how he wants us to spend the money that he has given to us. Notice the language. It's not the money that I have earned. It's the money that he has given to us. Because that you see the understanding of money as it relates to the scriptures. That's the implication of the Timothy lesson where the, in the letter of Timothy, the caution to those who are in this present age are rich and in the global economy that probably means at least 95% of us whether you think of yourself in that category or not. He says, as for those who are in the present age rich, command them not to be haughty. That's a harsh word. 
But the meaning of that is this. Haughty means, darn right I earn this money. I have the right to do with it anything that I see fit, and I don't want anybody, including the government or my church, telling me how I'm supposed to spend it. After all, I worked at the opportunities that were given to me. I applied myself. I got a head through the sweat of my brow, and I'm in this position because I work hard. And you know those people out there on the streets? They had the same opportunities that I did, but they didn't take advantage of them. They, they deserve to be that way. I've heard that, haven't you? You see, we a, a part of the American dream is that anyone, if he or she's diligent, works hard, can get ahead and really make something of himself. And those are the stories that we hold up in the newspapers and the like about somebody who came from nothing and out of that winds up owning, you know, ten condominiums. And those are things really do happen. But it's this terrible tragedy, a haughty tragedy, to generalize and as a result assume that if somebody is not one of those success stories, then they just didn't work hard. But I don't. That's haughtiness, as the scripture defines it. Instead of saying, you know, I'm in the position that I am quite honestly by virtue of God's mercy. He's the one that gave me what meager talent I might have. He's the one who's opened doors for me, some of which, you know, I deserve it quite honestly. Some of the breaks, that was just a gift, sheer gift. And out of that, whatever I might have is his. It's at his disposal. If you have any history in the church that goes back to the right one days, one of the things that used to happen when the offering came up is that, and this is a quote from Scripture, we would say together, all things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given thee. That's the appropriate understanding of money. It comes from God. If God chooses to give it to me, my job is to say, what do you want? What do you want me to do? And even when it comes to the issue of tithing, which I deeply believe in, by the way, more often than not, we use tithing as an excuse to spend the 90% any way we want to. And that's actually not the case. 90, the 10% is the floor. That's yours, whatever you want. Now I've got 90% else. What do you want me to do with it? Taking care of people I know? Sure, paying the bills. It's, I'm, I've got to be responsible. But I need to be asking God about purchases. So that literally whatever I have is at God's disposal. I actually don't have the right before God to just decide to do whatever I want, either with my time or with my money, because they both come from Him. And any attitude other than that fits into the category that, that the letter of Timothy would describe as in fact, what is held up in the scriptures, he says, pursue righteousness. And he defines it. Look in your lesson. Look in the Timothy lesson if you're leaving. In the middle, first of all, it says, but as for you, man of God, shun all of this. That's the love of money, wanting to get rich, keep working at it. Instead, what does he say? Pursue righteousness okay. and godliness. Now, what, is, what does that look like? Well, farther down, he describes exactly what that is. If you can find the Amen, which is one, two, three, four, five, up. And look at the next sentence that says, As for those who in this present days are rich, here's what righteousness looks like. Command them not to be haughty or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Most of us don't think like that. We want to make sure we just have a nice retirement. Believe me, no matter how much you've got socked away, it can disappear in a moment. And many people now know that because of the economy that we are in that did not know that in previous generations. So to set your hope on it, makes you sleep better at night, uh, it could be dangerous. 
but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In other words, it really does come from Him. That's why we say, God, what do you want me to do with it? <coughs> what does He say? They are to do what? To do good. And what is goodness? What is righteousness? To be rich in good works, generous, ready to share. In other words, generosity, righteousness, has everything to do with not so much with moral purity, it has everything to do with what you're giving away. That's generosity. That's, in fact, righteous. So that to this day, if you were to go to Israel, you go to these museums and places where they commemorate, quote unquote, the righteous. And who are they? They're the ones who helped the Jews during the Holocaust at great personal sacrifice. That's still the understanding of the word righteous that Paul uses here in this lesson. In other words, righteousness has to do with what you're giving away, being a servant to other people, making room in your schedule to serve those who are in need, both in terms of your time as well as your money. And that's righteousness. Most of us think of righteousness because of our sort of puritanical age as abstaining from sex outside of marriage or those kinds of things. And that's not wrong, but that's actually not the heartbeat of the meaning of righteousness in the scripture. It has to do with servanthood generosity. A willingness just to give it away. Whether you're talking about time or whether you're talking about money. So you are, in fact, if you're to pursue righteousness, you're looking for opportunities to make a difference in the life of another person. To care for those in need and reach out to them. To pursue righteousness. In other words, just to say, God, okay, you've given me a calendar, you've given me time, you've given me money, show me. What am I supposed to do? That's righteousness. That's doing good. That's what it means to be rich in good works. Generous, ready to share. See what I mean by starting the service by saying, oh God, if I'm in a place that is in need of mercy and pity, it's this morning. Because we really are captivated by wanting to be like the rich man. This morning, I got up early, and one of the things that I did is that I went on Twitter. You know what Twitter is. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> and um, I was looking at the Twitter feed, and there was a fellow that quoted his daughter, his five-year-old daughter, who couldn't find her pajamas, and she said, Daddy, I, the reason I can't find my pajamas is that I have small eyes. <laughs> I have small eyes. To be enamored with the rich man. To not know the names of the homeless. To continue to fight for my right to spend what I want. And to make my time my own is to live with small eyes. It's not to see life from God's perspective, or the perspective of the scriptures. It's instead facing the deep selfishness that really does run through our culture, and it runs right straight through here, to say, God, I need you to come in and change my heart. Open me to your love, to your compassion that knows no boundaries, that all people matter to you. In such a way, Lord, is that that generosity that you have so freely given to me might actually flow through me into the lives of other people. Because I'm the one standing in need of mercy. I'm the one standing in need because quite honestly, I confess, if I had my brothers, I'd rather be hanging out with the rich man. And clearly, that's not what the scripture is teaching. And I need you to help me to get there. That's the message this morning. Countercultural, not like what we necessarily even want to hear but it has everything to do with the Christian life that is in fact meant to be marked by sacrifice. P.S. 
At the end of the service, we're going to sing a hymn that most Episcopalians really love. And it's called Lift High the Cross. You know it? Of course you know it. What do we say? Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaimed. Two things. Number one, look at his sacrifice. The power of his death and resurrection. And look at how that kind of sacrifice is being demonstrated in the people who love him. That's what it means to lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaimed, till all the world adores his sacred name. How are they going to know if they don't see it demonstrated in the lives of his people who love him? It's on us, you see. Show your mercy, O oh Lord, that we might both receive and give the generosity that is truly yours. Amen. Amen.